everybody to our coming lecture uh, this afternoon. It's my uh, pleasure to introduce our, our speakers today. Actually, uh, our primary speaker is Dr. Dr. Tony Shaw, but his research is done in collaboration uh, with Dr. Don Sears. So I'm going to give you a little introduction on both of our speakers today before we uh, start out. So uh, Dr. Uh, Tony Shaw, he's a professor here at Brock University in the Department of Geography. Uh, many of you would be familiar with uh, Tony and have taken courses uh, with Tony for our students in the audience. Uh, but what many of you may not be aware of is that uh, Tony is one of our fellows with the Institute and actually has been affiliated with our Institute uh, for quite a few years. Uh, he teaches courses in the areas of meteorology, applied climatology, and of course, uh, viticulture. And his current areas of research include wine terroir, uh, site selection methods for new vineyards, uh, freeze protection methods, which uh, as you can see with our weather outside is very important and critical uh, to our industry uh, uh, this time of year, uh, wind energy, and also looking at climate change and how to mitigate the impact of, uh, of climate change uh, in terms of uh, viticulture. His current major research projects include determination of sub-appellations in Ontario's main wine regions, a uh, very uh, integral player in, in our sub-appellation program uh, for the UQA. Uh, he's also uh, looking at the climatic assessment of new and emerging areas for the production of this vinifera uh, here in Ontario as our, our wine producing regions continue to grow and uh, uh, test uh, those extremes as well as looking at uh, active freeze protection methods for vine and uh, fruit crops. Uh, he's uh, a regular uh, uh, contributor at international and, and national conferences, and also has a number of uh, collaborations uh, throughout Ontario, Quebec, United States, and uh, uh, even uh, as far away as France. Uh, he's also quite uh, excited to uh, continue to uh, talk to our new enologist, George Katsarinas, because he uh, has been to Greece a number of times and uh, toured through their cultural regions. So lots to talk about there. Uh, his research colleague, Dr. Don Sear, uh, who's in the audience uh, today, is an associate professor of finance in the Faculty of Business. Uh, he's also the former associate dean uh, in that faculty uh, for graduate programs and research and is also uh, one of our uh, Cundy Fellows uh, as well at uh, the Institute. He received uh, an MBA from the University of Saskatchewan, an MA in Economics, and then went on uh, for a PhD in Finance from uh, the University of Alberta. His primary research and teaching areas are in corporate finance and investments, uh, and he regularly teaches in the MBA program uh, here at Brock University. Uh, he holds a Chancellor's Chair for Teaching Excellence at Brock, and for those of you that took in the lecture series last year, uh, Don was the one that presented uh, uh, to the group, and, and Tony was there for answering and fielding questions, and this year they decided to, to trade off. Uh, in terms of research, uh, uh, he looks at uh, issues in, in financial and economic uh, issues sorry, relating to viticulture and the wine industry, with a particular focus on, on those issues here in uh, the Niagara region. Uh, he publishes widely in a number of peer-reviewed um, uh, journal articles, and you may remember uh, some of his work from last year uh, looking at these weather contracts uh, in mitigating weather-related risk. And uh, as I'm sure we're, we'll hear a little bit about today, uh, we just had a couple of those weather-related risks uh, this past month here in the region. Uh, uh, Don uh, uh, has also been highlighted in the Globe and Mail uh, and has uh, impact uh, beyond just the university and academic environment. He's a private consultant uh, and uh, works uh, regularly uh, with the industry. So with that, I'll leave it to uh, Dr. Shaw to uh, start, start us off with our lecture this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the audience here. Uh, for attending uh, this uh, presentation and uh, also like to welcome our uh, viewers on webcast and Kojiko as well. First of all, I'd just like to say that I think it was Yogi Berra who said, making predictions is difficult, especially about the future. I'll try that again, maybe another 20 joke. Uh. 
climate is changing all the time, and this, the time scale of course varies uh, from several hundred thousand years uh, to decades uh, to even a year. And this is why, especially in the agricultural sector, there's a great deal of risk associated uh, with a change in climate. If the change is gradual, then uh, society uh, is able to adapt. If the change is very dramatic, uh, then it's very difficult uh, for a community, a farmer, uh, to adjust readily. And so there are some risks, uh, depending on the scale of uh, change. In this talk here, what I'd like to do, first of all, I'd like to look at the evidence of climate change at the global level, and then talk a little bit about what's happening uh, at the various uh, continents, and then move on to a little bit about uh, climate change within the Great Lakes region, and then focus on uh, the, the changes that we see uh, within the major wine regions uh, of Ontario, namely Niagara, Lake Erie, North Shore, of Island, and the Sarah County. There is a definition for climate change. Uh, climatologists uh, like to define uh, climate change uh, in terms of long-term changes to temperature, precipitation, and so on and so forth. As you can see from the studies done by the IPCC Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, probably one of the most authoritative studies and probably one of the most comprehensive studies on climate change uh, impacts and adaptations. They have come, they've come to the conclusion that the changes that we're seeing in our climate, whether it be at the regional or global level, for the most part is attributed primarily to human activities. Now, there are skeptics who believe that uh, the change that we're seeing, especially in terms of global warming, that that could be due to natural factors, namely uh, sunspot activities. Now, the IPCC document uh, is very clear on that, that any type of change that might be attributed to natural factors, such as uh, sunspot activities, accounts for only a, a very, very small fraction of change in the energy which is unlikely uh, to give rise to the very dramatic change we've seen in temperature and precipitation patterns on a global scale. So I just want to point out to you uh, that the, there is very clear evidence for climate change when we linked it uh, to greenhouse gases. Now the one greenhouse gas, of course, that is uh, showing significant increasing trend ever since we started measuring greenhouse gas, in particular uh, carbon dioxide beginning in 1958 in Mauna Loa, Hawaii. As you can see from this graph, this is probably one of the most uh, widely viewed graph on, on uh, trends in, in this particular, uh, uh, in particular um, carbon dioxide. As you can see, uh, from 1958 to uh, roughly 2005, uh, these, and of course the current uh, parts, the current uh, measurement is about roughly 380 parts per million. So we've seen a steady increase in carbon dioxide levels. Now, those of course, there is a direct correlation to some extent between an increase in greenhouse gases and uh, as well as temperature. But the climate system actually does not behave in a linear fashion, in other words, an increase in CO2 doesn't necessarily translate to a direct increase in temperature. Mainly because there are many what we call feedback effects within the Earth's climate system, which tends to negate, if you will, the, the warming trend, such as cloud cover and what have you, and aerosols, which tend to reflect more incoming radiation. And that could bring about, if you will, a dampening of the, the rate of, uh, of warming. So, it is clear, however, both from the instrumental record and from our direct measurements of various greenhouse gases such as methane, uh, carbon dioxide, of course, uh, 
uh, nitrous oxide, CFC, and so on, that these gases are increasing at a very significant rate. And there is no question that there is a corresponding increase in temperature. This is a graph, of course, which shows uh, deviation in uh, temperature from the 1961-1990 average, which is the, the reference period used by uh, the IPCC. Uh, and, and so all temperatures then will deviate from that reference period. As you can see, uh, going back to the 1860s, the beginning of the so-called Industrial Revolution, uh, we've seen uh, a steady increase uh, in CO2, and that translated to a gradual increase in temperature, especially uh, from the 1960s onwards. You can see a significant increase in trend. And that correlates uh, very well uh, with an increase in especially carbon dioxide levels and various human-induced uh, changes such as deforestation and the intensification of agriculture. So at the global level, uh, we are seeing these trends. And studies have been done uh, at the continental level in just about all the, all the continents, with the exception, of course, of, our, of Antarctica, where there's no real increase in temperature uh, at this point in time. And certainly uh, in Australia, because this is we're looking here at the Southern Hemisphere, and the Southern Hemisphere, of course, is uh, comprised primarily of water. So there is a dampening uh, in terms of temperature increases. But all the continents are showing a gradual increase in temperature, uh, uh, which is very, very based on what we call the instrument record, the observational data, the empirical data. I'd like to look next at what's happening in, in Canada, because Canada is, of course, uh, one of these countries where the climate is very, very complex, because we have several geographic regions, each of which have somewhat unique climate, uh, even though we may think of Canada as being a cold country. Uh, certainly, um, in northern areas of Canada, quite cold, or we have the west coast relatively warm, east coast relatively warm, central Canada, in particular the St. Lawrence Great Lakes region, a sort of a semi-continental climate because of the moderation of the lakes, the prairie regions, very continental climate. So we have a really complex array of climate, so it is not fair to categorize Canada or place it into one uh, climatic classification. But we don't have time to do all those. So I just want to focus uh, on some important trends in Canada. Now, the winters, of course, uh, especially in southern Canada, and even in northern areas of uh, Canada, are getting warmer. Okay, there is a, these are trends. Uh, this is temperature data, average for uh, all of Canada. Uh, they sort of they departed from the, this one here from the 19, uh, I think it's 1961, 1980, in period. As you can see then, uh, our, our trend is that there's an increase in trend, but of course, notice the fluctuation. This is what is characteristic uh, of, uh, of much of the climate in the so-called middle latitude region, of course, that's where we are, much of North America and Canada. An increasing uh, trend, uh, but subjected to significant variability. I will talk about this. Don, of course, uh, Don and I have done some work on the risk associated with these uh, variability. It's not, it's not a question that the climate is changing. That is good, it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, that's, uh, in some cases. Uh, but it's the, it's the significant variability from one year to the next, from one day to the next, that I'll show you later on uh, when we look at the trends for Ontario. So I want to focus uh, on the Niagara region. Uh, I, I've also included data from the other wine regions, such as Prince Edward County and Lake Erie North Shore. I didn't include uh, um, Pele Island. Uh, we, don't have, we do have long-term data for Pele Island. Unfortunately, uh, the data is, uh, there's some missing data for the last 10 years for various reasons. So the Niagara region, you have an idea of the topography of the area. Now, 
Uh, when you look at the Niagara region and you're driving at 100, and, let's say 120 kilometers an hour, the legal speed limit, upper limit, okay, uh, and you drive along the QW and you look around, you see vineyards, and you probably say to yourself, uh, what a relatively flat area. But if you have uh, the notion to get off the highway and cross the peninsula, uh, you can appreciate uh, from a topographic standpoint that it is, there is a significant amount of topographic variability. Okay, and that of course translates to uh, significant differences uh, in the climate. Uh, when you look at the Niagara region uh, from a regional standpoint, from a very large scale, it appears a bit it is the so-called banana belt of Ontario. But when you get above the escarpment uh, and you go towards uh, Lake Erie, the so-called Haldeman uh, plain area, you find that climate is a bit more extreme there. And so it is not unusual to get sometimes minus 30 degrees centigrade uh, in the Barren Peninsula. Uh, so I just want to give you some idea of the the topographic variation, because much of the viticulture is confined to the area. Uh, right now, of course, we see more uh, expansion on, in the so-called Bindman Bridge subappellation. Uh, previously, that area was under primarily the Brusca Bridge, uh, but now we're seeing some uh, development uh, with respect to vinifera. Uh, so, and of course, the Font Hill Camus looks somewhat exaggerated here, but that is, at one time, used to be one of the most scenic areas in the Niagara region, and probably one of the, uh, probably the second area for a tender fruit, unfortunately it's all urbanized. Just a couple of statistics regarding the Niagara region, I just want to uh, pay attention to the heat units, never mind the acreage, but the 1,400 growing degrees, that is off well, the average of the Niagara region. In uh, our July temperature, roughly 22 degrees, or mean January minus 4, and our mean annual temperature, uh, 8.6 degrees centigrade. And I want to focus on these because these are means, okay? And uh, we'll see in some of the uh, observational data that I'll uh, produce in a moment that these are increasing, okay? Let's look at the annual mean temperature of the Niagara region. As you can see, from 1970 onwards, and this data comes uh, roughly to 2009, we have the maximum temperature, annual maximum temperature. This is the mean, and this is the minimum. Okay. All three are increasing. Okay. Some degree of variability, especially uh, in a uh, period subsequent to the 1990s. And Don and I talked about this when we did some work on ice one. Um, this is uh, one of the concerns uh, is that not only we're seeing an increasing trend, but we're seeing often term used uh, more volatile. You know? okay, in other words, it's like the Toronto Stock Exchange, right? For the most part, the trend is an increasing trend, but every day is subjected to significant variations. So if you go and sell your stock at the wrong time, you're in trouble. The annual mean temperature, just want to show you, that is increasing. So we are seeing, for example, an average of roughly eight and a half degrees, okay? Uh, and we are seeing that, that average is increasing uh, over the last 40 years. And if we were to project uh, the data using uh, the general circulation model, and we've done a little bit of that, it is quite likely that in about 40, 50 years from now, if the conditions persist, if we continue to have high levels of greenhouse gas uh, emissions, and that is not about to change. In fact, uh, uh, it is quite, and I'm quite willing to stand by that, and that is, as many of the emerging countries embark on industrialization, we will continue to see, in spite of uh, regulations, environmental control will continue to see an increase in, in greenhouse gases. And those gases, their residence time, of course, is as much as 100 years for carbon dioxide before it's actually removed from the atmosphere. So once emitted, these gases will remain there. And so present trends, if they continue, 
we could see a climate probably similar to what you might find south of the border, probably around New York State, Pennsylvania. Because this is what we're seeing. We're seeing a shift. A shift in, in temperature. And one of the ways in which we can actually anticipate some of the impacts of climate change is by looking at areas that have a similar climate to what we might expect to give us some indication of what we can expect in about 25, 30 years down the road. Now, 25, 30 years is not a long time. Um, in the, especially uh, when you're thinking in terms of vineyard, uh, permanent perennial crops. Uh, when you plant a vineyard, you expect for it to produce on a commercial basis, at least for 25 years. <coughs> So vineyards planted now uh, are likely to remain planted for the next 25 or 30 years. And so we need to look ahead, and I'll talk about this when we talk about adaptation. We need to look ahead uh, in terms of how the climate is changing and what type of uh, strategies that we ought to be uh, adapting uh, to minimize problems of risk. This is a study I've done uh, with Adam Fennett of Environment Canada, in which uh, he will be able to project uh, up to 2080, uh, based on the general circulation model, what is likely to happen to temperatures in the Niagara region. The upper line is the, if you will, the maximum, and this is the minimum. But most of the studies tend to follow in the middle here. So, more than likely then, uh, right now, the annual mean temperature in the Niagara region is about 8.5 degrees centigrade. So if conditions were to persist, it's quite likely that that would go an additional 3 or 4 degrees. So 12 degrees uh, annual mean temperature, as I said, that puts you somewhere probably in North Carolina in terms of the type of climate you can expect, especially in the summer months. Precipitation. We've seen no real trend in precipitation. Uh, it's, uh, if you will, a relatively flat curve, but of course uh, subjected to a high degree of variability. And this is, uh, of course, is of concern, as I said to you. It's not that the climate is changing, but we're seeing significant variability from one year to the next. And for viticulture, of course, when you're trying to produce quality wine, the consumer likes a consistent quality. Consumers are not faithful to a particular winery, particular wine region, if they can uh, purchase wine uh, for a cheaper or a lower price from another uh, area. Uh, and so, if you have wines that vary in quality from one year to the next, you can appreciate some of the challenges that wineries have uh, in hanging on to their customers. It is a very competitive business, as you can appreciate. The projected changes in precipitation is neither here nor there. Uh, at best, you might see uh, about 15 to 16 percent increase, uh, or in some cases, you can see a significant reduction. This is for total precipitation. Uh, I would look at uh, later on precipitation in the uh, in the growing in the growing season, especially uh, in the fall, because that is a serious problem for growers, especially uh, in the month of September for the early season varieties. So, what I'd like to do now is to look at the different seasons. I looked at, I looked at uh, the winter, the spring, the growing season, and the fall in terms of what's happening uh, to climate change. So let's look at winter. As you can see, I've looked at the minimum temperatures. This is uh, January, of course, as you know, it's the coldest month, and July normally is the, is the warmest. And as you can see, for the three wine regions, Niagara, Lake Erie, North Shore, and Prince Edward County, our minimum temperature, January minimum temperature, is increasing. Fluctuating trend, but certainly an increasing trend over the last 40 years. So the bottom line is, our winter is getting warmer. Uh, there's no question about that. That winters are getting warmer uh, based on the trend in minimum temperature. I looked at the uh, case for uh, just Niagara and Lake Erie. So we're seeing a uh, minimum temperature an increase over the last uh, 40 years of roughly 2.5 degrees centigrade. And that's significant. That is a significant trend. 
Um, see, climate change, natural climate change, is a much more, it's a much slower process. It may occur over a period of 20, 30,000 years, depending on the cycle. Uh, we are seeing these dramatic changes over a period of less than 40 years. And this is a concern because society in general uh, tend to uh, deal with these types of problems by looking at the past and expecting that whatever happened in the past is likely to occur in the future. Uh, but we never really look to the future and develop uh, policies and programs uh, to anticipate the changes. We always tend to react to what's happened in the past. And we'll talk about that a little bit when we talk about adaptations. Trends in the average minimum temperature in several county. This is one of our concerns, of course. Uh, even with minimum temperature, now this is an average, you can see uh, Prince Edward County is a very cold area. Okay. And they may not even look at, and I'll show you later on an example of this particular winter uh, in terms of the fluctuation that is characteristic of, uh, of our temperatures, especially in the month of January. Cold days. We looked at the number of events with temperatures below minus 50. Minus 15, of course, uh, can uh, present problems for uh, vines, especially in terms of blood damage, depending when it occurs. Uh, the phenology of the vine, of course, is changing all the time, depending on how uh, it's responding to the climatic stimuli. Uh, so minus 15 may not be uh, a serious problem in January, but it depends. I'll come to that later on. because. One of the things we are faced with in the month of January is the fluctuating trend. Uh, we have uh, uh, warm periods followed by cold periods. And as you know, vines that go through a dormancy period, uh, some varieties have their dormancy fulfilled after about roughly a thousand hours with temperatures below five degrees centigrade. Um, and once that dormancy period is completed, and normally dormancy period for many of these varieties are end by the end of January. And so, once that dormancy period is completed and you have milder temperatures, there's a good chance you have blood swell and, of course, you have problems. And as you know, this year we're into that. Uh, minus 20, we use minus 20 for the Niagara region uh, because minus 20 is the one typically used by most people looking at the risk of freeze injury uh, for vines and food crops. Uh, fruit crops. Um, Minus 20, of course, as you can see, for the Niagara region, we're seeing a significant trend downward. Okay. Um, 2000, 1992, uh, very, very cold. Uh, and of course, 2003, some of you may remember that. In the, uh, I recall that very well because I was doing some work in Prince Edward County looking at the feasibility of doing, using wind machines in that area. In the 2000, uh, uh, prior to 2002, no problem, but 2003 we had a very, very sharp drop in temperature. So, the good the news is that, yes, the occurrence of extreme temperatures that are likely to cause damage to uh, vines and fruit crops, that trend is a downward trend. But that doesn't mean that we can go to bed and sleep uh, and think that things will continue that way. This is for Prince Edward County. I picked Prince Edward County because uh, it is across from us, across the other side of the lake. So we are in the southern shore of Lake Ontario, they are in the northern shore of Lake Ontario. And so they get a good blast of hot, sorry, cold air before it crosses the lake and uh, it's moderated by Ontario before it hits the southern shore. Uh, so this area here, uh, unfortunately, will even though the trend is a, is a downward trend as well. I might add also, if we were to use the Niagara region as representative of the climate of much of southern Ontario, you'll see that the trends are all synchronous. Okay? If it's very cold in the Prince Edward County, the same trend you'll find, for example, in Lake Erie North Shore, uh, same find, trend you'll find in, 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 the, in the Niagara region. And that means that the same weather system uh, is affecting the area. Okay, so the trends in general for all three wine regions are pretty much the same. The magnitude of the change, of course, is different. Uh, 
but all the trends are very much the same. So if we were to look at what's happening in the Niagara region, and we can actually uh, do the same, the same we can expect for the other wine regions. Now, I looked at the data for this winter, and this is for a station in the Niagara region. As you know, we have, at this point in time within the sub Appalachian, I think there are 28 climatic stations. I've chose one in an area which is with sort of moderate climate. I didn't choose the one in the Vine Mountain region because you'll see extremely low temperatures. And if you go closer to Lake Ontario, you'll do find some temperatures dropping to below minus 20, but not as cold. But this one here is very typical of what you'll find in the Niagara region, with the exception of that. Notice this. See, this is, uh, by the way, uh, we start off in the beginning of, uh, of December, we're going towards the end of uh, January, February. Okay, so this is not right to left, but it's, it's not left to right, but it's right. So this is uh, December here, and this is end of, uh, well, is it February the 2nd? Okay. Now, can you see then what we're talking about? Okay, <clears throat> we start off with temperatures above zero, and then it goes down, and it goes back up again, comes back up again, down, goes up, and so on and so forth. And of course, we know that uh, in this area, we have some bug damage for some varieties. So this is one of the things that we're seeing, is the tremendous variability from one day to the next. Okay, so we have temperatures way above zero. Okay, uh, at this point in time, and then it keep on dropping, and then drop, and then it went back up again, and so on and so forth. And for those of you who are viticulturists or growing grapes for you know, years, uh, uh, this is a very serious problem. So even though our winters are getting milder, what we're seeing is this kind of free thought cycle, which is not good for vines. Especially if these free thaw cycles occur towards the end of January and in February. Because most varieties would have completed their dormancy period. Varieties such as Merlot and Chardonnay, in fact, they are very cold hardy in January and, and up until probably the beginning of uh, February or <coughs> mid February. But they lose their hardiness quite quickly. Okay, because they're early season varieties, Merlot, Chardonnay, they bud early, and therefore, even though they're very, very winter hardy, their dormancy requirements actually are fulfilled quite early, and therefore those varieties are very susceptible to freeze damage, especially in view of the fluctuating temperature that we see. So, while on one hand, our winters are getting milder, we're not seeing as many uh, sub-zero temperatures as we've seen in the past, what we're seeing, especially uh, in the months of uh, December, January, and February, are these fluctuating temperatures, warm spells, or by cold spells, and so on and so forth, which is not good at all. And this is, as you can appreciate, this is Prince Edward County here, down to minus 35. Now, obviously, at minus 35, it doesn't matter what you do there, right? You can have wind machines unless you go and blow hot air on the vines, right? you will have damage inevitably. So these are some of the things that we have to deal with in a changing climate. It is not a change which is gradual. It is a change which is uh, unfortunately very volatile. And that is one of the reasons the risk for viticulture becomes extremely important. Uh, so as viticulturists, when we're looking to develop varieties, uh, we need to pay attention. We are not out of the, uh, out of the danger zone uh, with climate change. Uh, in fact, we could be even more susceptible uh, to these vagaries in the, in the weather as we are observing uh, in the case of this particular winter here. Don and I did some work on uh, ice wine uh, because and I'll skip that there, because most people, uh, or I'll just leave this slide off here. We looked at the date for uh, Harrow, and final uh, long-term data in terms of the picking hours and, and the days that are suitable for harvesting ice wine at temperature below minus eight. 
Minus eight, of course, uh, uh, is the threshold used by the BQA. So when you, uh, for the wine to be considered officially ice wine, it must be harvested with temperatures at minus eight and lower. But we know that the growers uh, much prefer to harvest the grapes at temperature roughly minus 10, minus 12 for various reasons. And what we're looking at uh, for this area, we looked at the, I'll skip this one, minus 12 degrees, but this is it, uh, for the Niagara region. I looked at the number of days with events uh, minus 8 and lower for the Niagara region. So December, and of course January, and of course February. Now, we know that by end of February, forget it, it's very mild temperatures, and you're expecting to pick ice by most of it would have rotted, and the animals got the other half, and so uh, by the end of January, if it's not harvested, you may have a problem with the hand. But as you can see, uh, we're seeing uh, December, not a very significant trend, um, but certainly January, uh, we're seeing these, again, significant fluctuations, especially uh, in the latter part of the 90s and onwards, and of course, certainly for February as well. So the industry, obviously, uh, is one with a lot of risk, because uh, you're leaving a crop out there, uh, and if the temperature doesn't drop early enough, this year, fortunately, we were, we're lucky. Uh, but the trend is one we will probably see uh, uh, fewer picking days uh, in the years to come, and quite possibly we may have to change the threshold temperatures for picking wine. I know in Germany uh, it's a little bit higher, it's not minus 8, it's a little like Austria, similarly, it's a little bit higher. Um, so I suspect that in years to come we may probably look at minus 6 degrees, because the, the way first Austria and Germany are, uh, because of uh, relatively milder winters. Same trend altogether for uh, the Niagara region. And I looked at it, the same Lake Erie North Shore. Lake Erie North Shore, I think, is going to emerge as a very important wine region in Ontario. Um, it has the climate, uh, and uh, it is an area uh, which shows a lot of promise. But the same trend, as I said, if you were to put the two graphs, all these graphs together, uh, all these trends are the same. The fluctuating temperatures are very much same, very similar. Uh, so the trend is a, is a downward trend, in other words, in terms of uh, picking hours uh, for uh, ice wine. So I moved on from ice wine to, to see what's happening to our, our climate during the transitional period of April and May. Our springs uh, getting warmer, are they getting colder? What's going on? So, I looked at the frost free days, and the frost free days for the three wine regions, uh, and how I delimit or define the frost free day as a temperature. For example, the last spring frost is defined as when temperatures drop to minus, the last temperature is minus two degrees. And the fall frost, the first fall frost, is when you have a temperature of minus two. I didn't use zero because uh, Environment Canada defines the frost period using zero degree threshold. Uh, but for viticulture, minus two is what is likely to have uh, damage on open buds or even swollen buds. Uh, certainly, uh, young tissue at minus two. So, as you can see, for all three regions, Niagara, Lake Erie, Norwich, and Simcoe County, we're seeing an increase in frost free period. Um, which is good, which is good especially for some of our late season varieties because you know uh, the variety that in general the end of the growing season is terminated uh, once you get a frost of minus two degrees and you have a canopy frozen, that's it, you have to harvest the crop. And I looked at, uh, got out the trend. Also looked at the heat units for the spring. Uh, April and May. We're not seeing any significant trend in uh, April for the Niagara region. In other words, uh, the growing degree there uh, appears to be pretty flat. Again, uh, fluctuating, uh, but not an increasing trend. But May, the month of May, 
uh, appears to show some increasing trend, and again, all characterized by significant uh, variation from one year to the next. Okay. Now, this is one of the problems with what we call a middle latitude climate. In a middle latitude climate, you're hit from both sides. You have very cold Arctic air descending, as we've seen, and then when the jet stream dips way down south, it takes that cold Arctic wave sometimes way down in Florida. And then as it pulls up northwards, northeastward, it pulls up warm air. And so you have uh, this contrast in temperature. Uh, on one hand, very cold days and warm days. And this, for example, the snowstorm that we had uh, last week, uh, that is a system that developed in the southwest uh, and then moved northeast into Ontario and then via St. Lawrence uh, Valley into Nova Scotia. Uh, on one side you have very cold temperatures, on the other side you have warm temperatures. And this is the sort of thing we can expect uh, uh, in a middle latitude climate. No two days are the same. Okay, no two days are the same. This is why the vintage varies every year. Okay, uh, each vintage in the Ontario wine regions and Canadian wine regions in general are unique. We don't have the persistency of the so-called Mediterranean climate, uh, in which, in, for the most part, uh, temperatures tend to be fairly high and each units are the same one year to the next. In our area, uh, our vintage, our year is different. Each units are different, beginning of the growing season is different, end of the growing season is different. And that what is very, very challenging for, for grape growers in this region. And let's look at the heat units for the entire growing season. And I toss this diagram here just to show you where the Niagara region stands vis-a-vis uh, -vis the rest of some very prominent wine growing areas. Now, this was a study I did for Pinot Noir, looking at uh, climates where Pinot Noir uh, tribe where significant uh, acreage is under Pinot Noir. So this is the average heat units for the Niagara, roughly 1,400 growing degree days. And as you can see, uh, Niagara is quite high up there. Okay. The heat units, the total heat units from April to the end of October, average about 1,400. And in comparison to other areas, uh, uh, as we can see, some very cool areas. Schaffhausen is in, is in uh, uh, Switzerland, the Valais region is in Switzerland as well. Uh, of course, you have the German areas, Alsace, uh, much lower. Uh, and of course, we have Russian River, which is in California, uh, Walker Bay, which is in uh, South Island, New Zealand. So, we have a, actually, we do very well in terms of total heatness. But I don't have the diagram to show you. One of the concerns about uh, our climate is that our heat units actually peak in the month of uh, August, September, and drop off dramatically. So while our total heat units might be quite high, and we often compare ourselves to the Bordeaux region, the Bordeaux region, of course, they themselves are having some serious issues uh, with climate change. Um, uh, I've spoken to this, a number of people at international conferences, and, uh, and of course the Europeans uh, have done a lot of uh, very, very fundamental work on climate change uh, long before we've embarked on it in North America and Canada. So they are seeing some significant change, especially uh, in the southern parts of Europe, in the Mediterranean climate, where temperatures are getting very, very warm. The climatically cooler areas, such as the Champagne region, uh, those areas are also seeing a significant increase in heat units. Of course, Germany, northern Germany, the Moselle, Ruhr, Saar Valley areas, these areas are seeing significant changes in heat units, early blood bursts, and so on and so forth. So, my concern here is that while we may have a high number of heat units, it's the way it's distributed. So, when we plan for new varieties, very often, uh, looking at the total accumulation of heat units during the growing season 
uh, in terms of assessing the potential of that particular variety is not necessarily the best thing to do. We need to look at how the peach heads are actually distributed throughout the growing season. So while we may say that we are very close to Bordeaux in terms of their total heatiness, if you look at the distribution of heatiness in Bordeaux, you'll see it's much even. There's, there, September, you don't see a dramatic drop off, or in October, um, the, it's sort of a smooth decline uh, in the growing season. Of course, the Bordeaux climate uh, suffers from the same problem we suffer, that is excessive precipitation during the harvest period. So what might be like a vintage year, uh, up until the end of October, sorry, end of August, uh, come the month of September, you can see a deluge in terms of precipitation and you have a deterioration in the quality. And this is just an example of uh, what we see, for example, in other areas, the Burgundy region. This is a deviation from the mean temperature, the growing season mean temperature. As you can see in the Burgundy region, they're also increasing the Rhine area. But of course, Barolo in Italy, and this is the Bordeaux region. And Natalie uh, sent me uh, an email. In uh, in that email, of course, uh, one of the presenters from Bordeaux, uh, their research unit there, they are also, as I said, doing a lot of work on climate change. That area, uh, even though it's close to the Atlantic Ocean and is supposed to experience some moderation from temperatures. Their winter temperature, of course, is quite moderate, but they are not immune from uh, long-term changes in temperature, especially during the growing season. So the border area is also under uh, a potential adverse impact from uh, global warming or an increase in uh, global mean temperature. Now, can we expect warmer temperatures during the growing season? Yes. Uh, this is, uh, we looked at the number of days with temperatures greater than 30 degrees centigrade. Why 30 degrees? Because 30 degrees you have some stress to uh, photosynthesis, a re uh, significant reduction in photosynthesis. You have moisture stress and uh, quite likely you may have some reduction in sugar levels and so on and so forth. Uh, sorry, uh, reduction in acidity. Uh, so what we're seeing uh, over the last 40 years Again, uh, very, very volatile, but certainly an increase in the occurrence of extreme maximum temperature. And that is a concern. That is certainly a concern because it does have implications for quality, uh, it has implications for irrigation, and so on and so for moisture stress. I looked at the overall 20 degree days for the 3 1 region, and this, in fact, is very heartening. Okay, because what we're seeing, even though, as I said to you, the mean heat units for this area is 1,400 uh, growing degree days on an average. The average statistic never, you know, never have, the average never occurs, right? And we use that as a simply a way of comparing things. But as you can see, uh, for all three wine regions, we have Lake Huron, North Shore, uh, of course, the Niagara region, and Prince Edward County here. Uh, and then, as I said to you earlier, I noticed the trend. Everything is in synchrony, right? So when we're looking at long-term trend, we, we use the Niagara region as an indication of what's happening elsewhere. You, you know, it's quite accurate to make some, uh, some conclusions from that. But that's good in a way. Uh, our total heat units are increasing. Um, and that means that, as I'll see later on, possibly some varieties that we're struggling with in terms of uh, reaching maturity, especially uh, Cab Franc and Cabernet Sauvignon, uh, it's quite likely that these varieties might do much better in a warming climate. And this is just uh, looking at the two main uh, wine regions. So we've seen uh, an increase from over the 40 year of roughly 150 heat units for the Niagara region and 200 for Lake Erie North Shore. And that is very significant. That is very significant. So the, our, our growing season is certainly getting warmer. Whether it's getting longer is not a question. Okay? Because one, one of the problems in using heat chips is that if you simply use, if you use a, a, a cutoff value of, let's say, 25 degrees, the base, of course, is 10 degrees. If you use a cutoff of 25, you're okay. 
But in some cases, if you don't, if you're using thermophile, if you have a mean temperature of 30 degrees, then we know that that is somewhat exaggerated because we know that uh, photosynthesis declines when temperatures reach a certain level. Okay? So it might be misleading. So some of the studies, when they look at heat units for an area, they may use a cutoff of 18 degrees in some cases, uh, some thermophile. So I have used a 25 cutoff uh, for the, these areas. So what you're seeing here is not an exaggeration of the heat units, but more realistic in terms of uh, how it may affect the uh, vine growth. And the heliothermal index is another measure of heat. I wouldn't go into that. The Winkler index is a more uh, uh, favored one. One of the concerns for us in the Niagara region is the growing season uh, in the months of September and October because uh, most uh, viticulturists will tell you and winemakers that the quality of the grape and the wine are actually determined by the types of temperature that we have in the months of uh, October, sorry, September and, and certainly October after the long uh, late season varieties. So I wanted to see what's happening to our fall. Is our fall getting warmer? Which means if that's a good thing, it will be a good thing for some of the late season varieties such as Riesling, uh, Cab Franc, uh, Cabernet Sauvignon, and even some new varieties that are being experimented with such as uh, Syrah. And as you can see, the, the month of September, uh, we're seeing fairly uh, significant warming trend, but again, this is characteristic of all our data, uh, very volatile, um, you know, it's up and down. Um, so the last, the last 10, 15 years, uh, we're seeing more volatility in terms of temperature. Now, our, our October is not getting very warm, unfortunately. There's no real significant trend in October. I wish that were the case, uh, because then you can safely harvest uh, Cabernet Sauvignon away from, uh, or closer to the lake or the middle of the area, but that is certainly not the case uh, for the Niagara region. This is the Niagara region uh, trend. Helotrumbal index is another measure. I looked at that. The Huben index, same, same information here. Uh, and what I try to do is to project uh, what could happen if these trends were to continue. Okay, so um, the Huben index um, is also a very important measure of the, of the heat potential of an area. And uh, again, uh, this one here, we're seeing some, uh, some trend, increasing trend. So the fall is looking good uh, for, for us in this region here, and for that matter, all the wine regions of Ontario. And similarly with the temperature trends, uh, all increasing trends. Now, one of the concerns, of course, with uh, the harvest period is not only to have the right temperature, uh, but also to not have any rain if at all possible, right? Especially in the month of uh, September and October. And uh, what we're seeing here uh, is that a slight downward trend uh, in uh, precipitation uh, for September, uh, October, it's a very weak increasing trend. Okay. So, um, in fact, again, very significant variation. So, it's hard to say anything about the precipitation trend. And this seems to be the, data, the problem for the data, not a problem, but this seems to be the trend for precipitation within the Great Lakes area. There's no real significant trend in precipitation, and that is reflected. Uh, certainly on a monthly basis or a seasonal basis within the Niagara region. Okay, so what I've done in this particular uh, slide here, I've looked at the trend in total heat units for two main one regions. I didn't want to clutter the the graph with uh, <clears throat> too many. Uh, so I looked at simply the Niagara region and the Lake Reno chart, <clears throat> and looked at the the minimum threshold uh, heat units for maturing different varieties. Okay, as you can see, 
Riesling can do very well with just about a thousand growing degree days. And in fact, uh, in the northern areas of Germany, we have produced some excellent Riesling. Uh, each of them is a thousand. Uh, mind you, of course, all the areas that are south or south east facing slopes, so they're exposed to maximum sunlight for that reason. Uh, but as you can see, uh, Riesling Chasselas, which is, I don't see much of that, but this is a variety which is probably the number one white variety in Switzerland. Of course, Pinot Noir, uh, which is a fairly important variety in the Niagara region. Um, no problem, of course, meeting the total Ichinets, and of course, Chardonnay, uh, which is a more uh, versatile variety, because Chardonnay can be grown in a wide range of climates, from very warm to very cool, uh, depending on the style. And Sauvignon Blanc, um, uh, we have all the minimum heat requirements for these varieties. Uh, the problem, of course, is you know with Sauvignon Blanc, it doesn't do so well in our area because it's not a very cold hiring variety unless you have a wind machine sitting right over the vineyard uh, or you wrap it up in some um, uh, protective cover. <coughs> but the other varieties, the reds, um, we're seeing Merlot, uh, Cabernet Sauvignon, and Camfran. And these are, um, we have more than adequate number of heat units, but as I said to you, um, we need to look at how these heat units are distributed. So one of the next thing I hope to do is not just look at total heat units uh, for these areas, but to look at each year and see how uh, growing degree days are distributed throughout the growing season. So we have a better appreciation of the climate of that area to see when, for example, we have a significant uh, decline in heat units so, so that some varieties planted have a good chance of reaching maturity if the heat units uh, have a less precipitous decline. But as you can see, uh, if you were to look at the trend in heat units, uh, certainly red varieties will do very well in the years to come. As it is right now, in uh, the Lake Erie North Shore area, where we have over 1,500 growing degree days, um, that area is seen to be probably the area where it's more than likely that you'll see more consistency in the production of reds. Um, because the heatiness in Lake Erie Archer are uh, very, very high. The frost free period is very, very long. And because they're very close to uh, Lake Erie, uh, Lake Erie still remains very, very warm even in the late part of the fall. And so that area benefits significantly. And the winds are coming, of course, from the southwest, the prevailing winds are. So westerly winds, and so you have some uh, uh, moderation in temperature and a much longer growing season in that area. So when we look at the the trends in heat units, it is an increase in trend. But uh, unfortunately, as I said to you, uh, this is a kind of pattern seesaw pattern that we're seeing here. Okay. So no two years are the same. Okay. Uh, I wish I could show you a graph of uh, the Bordeaux region or even uh, Napa Valley. Um, Napa Valley itself is not the most stable area. There are seeing some changes in temperature. Fortunately, the Pacific Ocean is right there. And the way weather systems move, they move off the Pacific uh, onto the continent. And so whatever happens in the Pacific affects that entire region along the, the California coast. And so the prediction of what happens in California has a lot to do uh, with the way in which you uh, forecast uh, uh, ocean temperatures. If ocean temperatures are changing, then that is likely to impact that area. Um, so I want you to <coughs> pay attention to this graph here because this is the sort of problems that we're faced with in a change in climate. Uh, increasing, but very, very volatile. Now, so just to uh, sum up then, um, what are some of the things we can expect uh, over the next 25, 30 years? Obviously, the winters are getting warmer. There's no question about that. Uh, we're seeing uh, uh, our spring frosts. Uh, we're seeing uh, not as not occurring as, as as late as normally. But we do have we might see some earlier uh, spring frosts. Summers are getting warmer. Um, high frequency of days in extreme. Uh, Maximum temperatures, as we've said, uh, greater volatility in the weather overall, 
um, and more than likely you may see some significant reduction in precipitation. I wish I could show you some of the work that's being done elsewhere on climate change and its impact on the culture and wine quality. There's a lot of uh, work already ongoing in Europe and of course uh, Australia, very, very, very susceptible uh, to climate change. Uh, of course, California. Um, but, and most of these studies, especially in the northern areas, are showing very early bud rate and flowering. Uh, the work done in Germany shows very, very clearly that the, uh, even though Germany is known uh, primarily for the production of white wines, uh, and of course a few uh, red varieties such as Spain and more, but we're seeing uh, significant changes in, in German regions as well. And certainly even the Champagne region, which is a cool area with just over probably eight, nine hundred heat units, ideal for a Champagne, very high acidity uh, wine. There is some threat in that area as well. Uh, but the Champagne region, uh, is those changes are a little bit more gradual. The more dramatic changes are seen in the drier and warmer areas. And this is why there is some concern for Southern Australia, for California. Uh, I know studies came out that uh, Napa is, is not seeing any significant increase in trend in temperature. And that, of course, has to do with the, the influence of the Pacific. Because on very, very hot days, uh, what happens is that warm air rises and it brought, draws in the cooler air of the ocean, the same kind of uh, situation we have on the Lake Ontario side and Lake Erie side. On a very, very warm day, the strength of the lake breeze increases, and so there is some moderation. The lake breeze penetrate further inland in the warmer the days. So that's a good thing about a bit of culture within the Great Lakes region. As long as we stick very relatively close to the influence of the lake, uh, there's a good chance that uh, we can uh, moderate the temperatures. And it's quite possible that if it weren't for the Great Lakes, that we could see even much higher temperatures. Uh, obviously, we'll see even more severe winter temperatures but certainly you will see much warmer temperatures if it warm for the Great Lakes. So I recall it's no coincidence that uh, wine production has developed uh, around the Great Lakes. And, and so what I'll see in, uh, in, in some time to come is that we could see uh, some new areas emerging. I know there is a lot of concerns uh, with growing grapes of all this happening here in, in the Niagara region, but it's quite likely that as you get closer to the Lake Erie side, because Lake Erie, the studies are showing that Lake Erie, for the most part, uh, uh, in many winters now, it remains open. So the lake obviously can provide some moderation, especially in terms of uh, uh, frost, and certainly in terms of winter temperatures. We're seeing uh, some, uh, some interest in growing grapes in the Huron County, uh, around Godbridge area. We're seeing some uh, interest in growing grapes the, uh, around Church and Bay Area. Uh, these are areas, I, I think, in the years to come. Right now, they're climatically marginal, mainly because they still have very, very cool winter temperatures. But it's quite possibly that these areas uh, uh, will uh, be able to grow grapes, uh, not to say that you're completely free from, from winter injury and spring frost, because it doesn't matter where you are in any grape growing area, it's some challenge of some sort. But I can see uh, these areas emerging in the next 30, 40 years. Uh, right now, I think the area, Lake Erie North Shore and Peely Island are ideally suited for reds. They already have very high PGS, and these areas are likely to see an increase in the number of PGS. But what I would like to see is a warmer fall. If the fall remains warmer, then these late season varieties have a good chance of, uh, of reaching their full maturity. I, I see also some shift in less cold hardy varieties, uh, such as uh, Sauvignon Blanc, uh, Pinot Grigio. Uh, these are varieties, obviously, they do well in the growing season. There's no question they can do well in the growing season, but the question is whether they survive the winter. And if the winters then are getting milder, it's quite possible that these varieties uh, will try. Now, We've, been, we've invested in wind machines, and wind machines have certainly uh, significantly reduced uh, winter injury. Um, there are other ways 
of protecting mines and in fact I'm doing some work using uh, some of the, uh, there's a horticultural um, material that you can actually use to protect the vines where, and we're seeing some significant differences in the temperature uh, inside the, the canopy and outside in this cover that you use in this cover which is as much as 8, 9 degrees difference. So for wineries that are interested in growing <coughs> exotic varieties uh, and can um, probably um, able to make a profit from the fairly the high labor and material costs of using this kind of uh, protection, uh, more than likely you will see a diversification of uh, some of the strategies used for uh, minimizing uh, winter injury. Expansion, I see as I said, expansion of viticulture in the north course, but in preferred snow belt areas to Great Lakes, because we still need to stay within the Great Lakes, because the climate, because great, the best quality wine, as you know, is produced under relatively moderate temperatures. And one parameter I am really concerned about, and I haven't dealt with it in this uh, presentation, is the diurnal temperature range. The range in temperature between the, the difference in temperature between the maximum of the day and the minimum of the day. What we're finding, and this is a phenomenon which is worldwide, we're seeing a significant increase in the minimum temperature. In other words, the night time is get, the nights are getting warmer. Okay, there has not been a significant increase in maximum temperature. But the nighttime temperatures are warmer. Now that certainly has impact and implication for wine quality. In the Niagara region, the average diurnal temperature range is about 10 degrees centigrade, and that is not a very significant variation. In other words, the days are warm and the nights are warm, which means that you have very good sugar levels, but acidity can be uh, um, can go down quite significantly if temperatures remain high. So I'd like to see what's happening to minimum temperature uh, with global warming and climate change because that is one parameter, especially in the uh, harvest period, uh, uh, where the, the diurnal temperature range becomes very, very important in terms of preservation of mass. <coughs> so those are some areas um, that are likely to be impacted. Now, one of the things, of course, with mallow winter is that you can see a proliferation of pests and disease in the, in the, in the growing season. Okay. And this is a concern. Uh, all the studies have shown that, uh, that our winters are getting milder, and it's quite possible that we could see an infestation from, uh, from outside of the region, because the climate, uh, with climate change, species are migrating very, very slowly. Okay. We've seen that in terms of what's happening with ocean uh, currents uh, during an El Nino or La Nina, okay? uh, huge migration of fish species in response to the temperature, because they always want to be in the environment in which they're most comfortable. And so with climate change, we could see some significant shift in the pest infestation. And, and so while our winters are getting milder, uh, very often I think sometimes very cold winter, not cold below sub-zero, but something that cold enough to kill off the pests might be a good thing. Now, adaptation. One of the, probably the biggest obstacle to climate change is to get people to change. The climate is changing, where are people changing in time to respond uh, to uh, the impacts? As I said, the unfortunate thing is that we tend to respond to what has happened in the past because we know what happened in the past and uh, so uh, we, we think that that's likely to happen again and insurance companies, I guess when they look at risk, they look at the history, the historical record and so okay, you had 10 events in the temperature below minus 20, it's quite likely that those events will persist in the future. But we need to anticipate uh, what's, what's likely to happen. This is where the models come in. Uh, uh, the modeling studies, and we're, I'm trying to do some work, well, we are doing some work with Environment Canada to look at uh, how we can actually forecast uh, long-term trends in temperature and precipitation and how then we might use that information uh, to make uh, changes to viticulture practices. Because, as you know, uh, developing varieties take a long time. Uh, it's not like you can simply like wheat, you know, if you don't uh, if you don't want to plant, we just say you plant soybean next year. With horticulture crops and, and fruit crops and vine crops, 
once planted, they're there for a long time. So a significant amount of investments, you want to make certain that you do the right thing. So I think some of the, in looking at what is likely to occur and making the necessary adaptive uh, changes, I think is very, very essential to the industry. So right now, I think in the Niagara region, we are, and certainly in, in Ontario as a whole, we are looking to see how might we uh, better forecast what is likely to happen, how, what sort of strategies we might have in place now, what sort of government programs and policies, uh, what kind of research uh, uh, can be done. And, I, and I'm making here a plea for uh, more research, uh, not, not, necessarily, not necessarily looking at what happened, but anticipating what is likely to happen so that we have uh, uh, these strategies in place and we have programs uh, in place to deal with climate change. And rather than go on and on here, I would be more than happy to uh, take some questions. I have some uh, some practices, develop water conservation measures. Everyone should do that. Uh, but I would, Don and I, be looking at investment in crop insurance because this is one way in which um, you can actually minimize the risk. But as you know, insurance companies will not continue to uh, to, in, uh, to insure uh, a very high risk area uh, of the of the industry. Um, we know that, for example, if you live in parts of Florida, you may not get any hurricane uh, insurance because the frequency of hurricanes has increased and the insurance company cannot continue to, uh, to bail out people who want uh, 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 hurricane insurance. So it is one strategy that we have, uh, but we need to look at managing the environment and I'm talking over here about uh, preventative measures and adaptive measures. Uh, so there, there's a host of things that we can do. Um, one, of the, uh, one of the things that we, uh, we've seen in our wineries is the use of uh, uh, solar panels, wind energy, geothermal. This is becoming very, very big in California, um, where your so-called footprint, the one much repeated work uh, in terms of uh, minimizing your carbon emissions. Uh, these are some of the strategies that wineries are using already. Uh, using a more passive type of uh, solar uh, and or electricity. And I would, uh, I just wanted to go back very quickly to this slide here. Um, these are the findings I try to summarize on a worldwide basis uh, based on the studies that are done, uh, especially in Europe, California, and Australia. Uh, um, you're seeing much warmer temperatures on a worldwide basis. And so these are some of the uh, problems that are likely to be encountered, not only in the Niagara region, but in most wine regions of the world. Because viticulture is so climate sensitive, it's one of the most uh, sensitive areas of our agriculture. And I'll stop there. Been reports on the news programs concerning La Nina. They have talked about cycles in La Nina and El Nino. It has been said that we are entering into La like Nina cycle, which could last from 20, 10 to 30 years. When in La Nina, the jet stream dips prior to the Great Lakes and results in a change in prevailing weather patterns bring colder winter temperatures. Can you please comment on that? And I think I know who that question is coming from. <laughs> I received that question in my own email and I didn't have a chance to respond to it. Um, La Nina, of course, uh, is the one that's a cold ocean current. And that, of course, is what is uh, keeping temperatures quite cool on the Pacific side. Um, boat boats, boat uh, phenomena are actually fairly destructive depending on uh, where they occur with more intense. We're seeing, for example, in Australia, uh, very, very heavy precipitation and severe hurricanes in Australia associated with a, uh, with a La Nina, not El Nino, but La Nina. Uh, for Canada, um, La Nina tend to uh, bring a bit colder temperatures, uh, especially on the, in the prairie regions on the west coast. Uh, 
uh, we tend to see some milder temperatures as the jet stream dips down south, but when it moves back up north, it pulls up warmer temperatures. So we see with uh, La Nina more severe storms. Uh, and, and this, of course, is what we've seen this winter here. Uh, but, La, but El Nino, El Nino tend to bring more uh, milder winters uh, to the Great Lakes area, to much of Canada. Um, but there's no real, uh, the pattern of the jet stream can vary quite significantly, even within uh, La Nina and El Nino uh, uh, phenomena. I have another question. <laughs> um, what material used is for frost protection other than wind machines? What material is used for frost protection other than wind machines? Well, we know that um, you can bury the vine, and that's been done in uh, parts of Quebec, and certainly in Prince Edward County, uh, in the Midwest, uh, and certainly in China, uh, they have what you call a burying climbing. The vines are trained relatively close to the ground, and uh, they're buried. And of course, uh, it's a fairly labor-intensive operation. Uh, it is not uh, doesn't necessarily provide 100% protection, but it does. Uh, in addition to wind machine, you can use irrigation sprinklers for spring frost or fall frost. Um, what is being done now in some areas uh, is to cover. Uh, the vines, the vines have to be trained and pruned to a certain level, and then you cover it with this particular fabric. Okay. Uh, it's a white fabric that reflects a lot of the sunlight, so it, it, you don't warm the vine, uh, uh, speed up the, the, the warming process. That, that's a concern, right? You want the vines to go through the normal dormancy period. Uh, but that is something I think could work, and it has been used on a limited basis right now uh, in uh, Quebec. Uh, the, the company that's manufacturing the, the product is based in Montreal. I've seen it used in vineyards in Japan. I haven't seen it in China, uh, but uh, I've seen it used in the Midwest, and that might uh, prove to be effective, but the cost, I don't know about the cost, whether the cost is, is, uh, can be prohibitive, but it can be done by a large scale, but certainly in small vineyards in, in Quebec, it's been used quite successfully. Well, with that, uh, will you join me in uh, thanking uh, uh, Dr. Shaw for his presentation and uh, his collaborator, uh, Dr. Singh.